How's it going guys? Welcome back to the channel. As you can probably tell, this is a different format than I usually do. Usually I just do videos by myself and they're usually scripted, but uh, I've had some new ways of doing videos of just going off the top of my head. And I thought, well, it'd be good to start a podcast then. Uh, and I have with me, why don't you just introduce yourself? Um, hey guys, my name is Dominic. Um, I'm his younger brother. Um, so we just thought it'd be good just to do a podcast because our, you know, our ideas flow a lot better. Um, we don't really know what we're going to talk about, but we decided to open up with Christianity and Stoicism, and Stoicism is very interesting to me because, well, it was the first philosophy I was introduced to, um, and my opinion has changed drastically since then. Uh, we're both Christians now, and there's a lot of Christian Stoics out there, and Stoicism is one of the more popular um, philosophies, so we thought it'd be interesting to talk about it. So, Yeah, so we both go to UCLA, and today um, I was in class. There was a History of Early Christians class, and our professor was talking about the idea that the teachings of Christ were influenced by um, a lot of Greek thought. And I was thinking, you know, maybe that's backwards. And when you look at Stoicism, it's the idea that um, worldly things, pains and pleasures don't matter. And it's only the logos, the reason that matters um, in essence. And But yet for Christianity, it's the same, except that logos is no longer reason, it's uh, Christ. Right, and I don't see how, like, how do you prove or how do you dictate that reason is the logos? Like, do you just choose that? Because, I mean, you can choose reason or you can choose empathy as the divine sort of sort of thing. But with Jesus, you had someone who actually took a human form and you have an objective construction or life of, of objectivity. And the thing I don't like about our professor is historians, especially when they look at, especially religious <laughs> history, they, they look at it from a naturalist perspective, which you can't do. Because if there's an account, a historical account of, let's say, a miracle, we are unable to look at that as historians. Both of us study history, but you can't look at that because it's, it's not with the scientific method. But none of history is with the scientific method. You have, to have a, you have to have an observation. We have not observed any history. Like We never observed George Washington, yet we do history on him from accounts that we have. So I don't see why they, you don't have the same approach to that sort of practice. Exactly. And our, our school is like really secular. Right. Like that's, it's just ridiculous. That's so like they, they try to dodge any conclusion that is that Christ is the son of God. It's like, oh, maybe he did this. Maybe he was inspired by these people or this. But it's like they they try to make sure that it's not Christ. It's just they try to take it as secular as possible. And that's where I was thinking with the Stokes. Like they were sort of on the right track. They had like the right philosophical principle but they just missed the spiritual aspect of it they missed god and of course christ hadn't come yet but god was not a part of their logos and that's where i think the stoics missed the mark well there were stoics after jesus had already lived and died but i think also um sure you can look for the new testament since it came after the stoics you can say oh well christianity then was just just ripped off the stoics but if you look in the old testament with the book of ecclesiastes with solomon a lot of the things he said were similar to stoicism how this is all in vain there's no point in having basically king solomon had everything he had tons of money tons of women he built he worked and he kind of came to the conclusion he even had even said wisdom was in vain which is interesting even you being smart is in vain because eventually you're just going to go and everything that you work for is going to be given to someone else. Um, so there's a lot of like philosophical existential like philosophy in the Old Testament, which honestly to me is better than any philosophy really out. It says the same thing as the existentialists do, except it's not stupid. Like I think a lot of existentialists are honestly kind of dumb. Like, I think Nietzsche, I think Nietzsche is brilliant, for example, but what he comes up with is just, it's just, it's implausible. Like he, it was the Ubermensch and the individual who creates his own values. Like completely separate, you completely separate yourself from society, like from being even um, affected by it, like even affected by other ideas. How do you do that though? How, how would you, how would you take your ideas away from what society has given you? Like it's going to have an influence yeah. on you. So you can never have your own moral structure. But I said in the video too, there was one man who had his own moral structure <laughs> who he lived to perfectly, and that was Jesus, yet Nietzsche doesn't, didn't want to see that. Yeah, Nietzsche, kind of like the early Stokes, just completely dodged or missed the mark on on Christ. Well, he didn't even like the early Stokes either, He and I agree with him. 
Nietzsche? Yeah, right. because the early Stoics were, were, their whole thing was like living according to your nature. But the way you live is contrary to your nature. So Nietzsche was very like up and down, like kind of goes with his emotions. The Stoics are more like level, right? But if you're going to live naturally, then wouldn't you go with how your body is reacting at a certain time? Like, yeah. It's not living naturally. Yeah, and Nietzsche, along with like most philosophers, they make tons of assumptions about the world that in order to even come to your conclusions, you have to assume so-and-so is true. Right. So the only moral compass that actually does not operate off of assumption, besides the assumption that God exists, is Jesus's teachings. Yeah, and then what's funny is I read um, Beyond Good and Evil by Nietzsche, um, and he hate his whole like first part of the book is saying how philosophers make assumptions and they need to really stop doing that. But all philosophers make assumptions right. because you, there's a certain kind of like, especially when they were trying to like think of the will, which interestingly enough, in the book of Ecclesiastes, it, it talks about how it's so horrible that it's, it's horrible that God has given us this life where we toil, like we toil just to live. Um, and we, it's a, it's an endless cycle. Like the wind blows constantly. The sun, we revolve around the sun constantly, just as we constantly are striving toward sustenance. Like we're striving for food, we're striving for interaction and stuff. And then Schopenhauer, who Nietzsche read and was influenced by, says the exact same thing. And King Solomon said it in what, a thousand BC, way before. And he thought of Schopenhauer's philosophy. Yeah. How do they not see this? I seriously don't understand. They don't see this. Do they not read the Bible? Yeah, dude, I'm not a philosopher. Yeah. I don't know all these people. I don't know Schopenhauer. I honestly only, like, thought of this Stoicism idea because of our class today. And I just, it just made me realize how a lot of philosophy comes very close to Christ. Yeah, and misses the mark in a way where it's just, it's completely discounted. Yeah. I mean, what do you think about Christian Stoics then? There think, are people who, who identify as that. I think it's kind of redundant to call yourself a Christian Stoic because as a Christian, you have to be Stoic. So it's just, as a Christian, you're not meant to be worrying about worldly possessions and worldly matters. So just the word Christian already kind of takes up the definition of a, of a Stoic in a different way. So calling yourself a Christian Stoic is just kind of redundant. And also the issue with calling yourself a Stoic is that Stoicism implies that your focus is reason right. when it should be God. Right. So I think just you should call yourself a Christian, but understand that the definition of Christian does take in a lot of Stoic ideas, such as not worrying about the world and, and focusing on God. It's also not worrying about your own death. But that's, that's where Nietzsche is right, too, is how is it natural for you to know that you're going to die? And Mark Lewis says, death stares to every, at every man, and every man just, all you can do is stare back. So there's nothing you do about your death. Yeah. You just have to know that it's about to happen. But how are you, <clears throat> as a Stoic, able just to look death in the eyes? Yeah, with no hope or... That's not natural. Yeah. Like, that's just not, na that's not living according to your nature. That's living contrary to your nature, yeah, I would say. It's almost like... There, the idea of stoicism is to try and go against against your nature because you know that death is scary, especially right. because you don't have hope. It's like, okay, how can I just come to terms with it in a way that just doesn't like it's just sort of their way to cut to come to terms with it without you know having any hope. It's just like, all right, that's it. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna worry about it. There's nothing I can do about it. And there's just sort of a defeatist mentality, but not you know breaking apart over it. What do you think of the idea that you can't? have a meaningful life or you can't do things with meaning without God or can you? I don't. I feel, that's like, hard. I feel it's a problem with what do you define as meaning? Yeah. That's what I was going right. to ask, but I didn't want to go down the rabbit right. hole either. Like what, like, but yeah, it depends what, what your idea of meaning is. It could be that God is meaning, right? In which case you can't live a meaning, meaningful life without God. But there are also plenty of atheists or non-believers, agnostics who, who do say that they've lived a meaningful life. So in that sense, it could be, and actually this is interesting because um, I was looking at Frank Turk and he, had, he said, so someone asked, so why doesn't everyone go to heaven if God loves them? It's like, because God loves them so much that he doesn't want to force them to be with them. So it could be that meaning for some people is not being with God. 
And that could just be, that also explains why God doesn't force you to be with them. He doesn't yeah. force a communion with you. Because yeah. he knows that there are people who are going to find their own meaning elsewhere. But mm. I definitely don't think that meaning is nearly as fulfilling as meaning in God. You know that, what, what that connects to? Um, Jordan Peterson says this, but I think this is just obvious anyway, is that everyone has God in some form or another. Some people believe in like the Christian God, but some people put all their energy into, let's say, their children, and that could be considered their God. And what's interesting is like the sin of idolatry isn't just me worshiping Ra from the Egyptian gods. It's me putting something else in the place of God to where, you know, like my channel, for example, I can put that in the place of God yeah. and I can look at that for all my meaning and satisfaction and put all my energy toward that is complete. That will be my God, essentially. So I guess there's a sense that people can derive meaning by, but they will have a God, essentially. Yeah. It was actually that Attack on Titan thing. It was like everyone was drunk on something. Right. But actually, I struggle with the same thing because um, I became a Christian because I got involved with this community and I ended up moving into their house. It was sort of like a Christian uh, brat type of thing. And the leader of our house of sorts said um, he was sort of worried because I, he was worried that I was worshiping the community. And that was like what was keeping me going, keeping me fulfilled. And it, it was true because I only got involved because I loved the people so much. They were so um, endearing to me. And I, I realized I had put them above God. My focus wasn't God. It was just keeping this community with people. And I sort of tricked myself into calling myself a, a true Christian because I was with a Christian. Yeah, community. but that's stupid. Because <laughs> you're not going to be a true Christian right when you become Everyone no, has exactly, some, yeah. some sort of idol when they first come into it. He was worried that I didn't know about it. And... I did, but it was good that he that he told me though, because a lot of people don't know. A lot of people think that they just go to church and just talk to people and not really think about God. And in a sense, you don't necessarily have to in order to be saved, but in order to grow in your faith, you have to gear your mind towards God. And I wasn't doing that. It seems like there's never like a middle ground. It seems like it just has to be an extreme. Either you have to do all these things to get to heaven, mm -hmm. or it's like. Just the complete opposite of like just do, which I probably lean more on the complete opposite yeah. of you're saved by grace through faith. But there's so many. L let's talk about that for a second. Yeah, I, was I was talking to you. Too. I was talking to you the other day about <laughs> this. There is a. It's the verse. It's the verse in Hebrews, and it's God disciplines and scourges those who He loves. Yeah. Right. And if you guys don't know, well, so discipline. Well, discipline for us means like if you spank some like your child. That's disciplining your child. But back then, it's, it derives from the word disciple. So it basically means to teach. To scourge is what Jesus was tortured with. Um, it's, it's a whip with a bunch of things on it and has metal things on it. So it, it goes, not only does it whip you, it goes into your skin and it completely like rips the flesh. So, that's, so the verse goes, um, God disciplines and scourges those who he loves. And then you have Christians who are like, yeah, God scourged me when I was a teenager because I did all this delinquent stuff and it really, you know, he really taught me a lesson and I'm just so grateful that he taught me. I'm like, well, first of all, no one is grateful for being scourged. Like, don't compare you being an idiot to, to being scourged. It's like that Proverbs verb of yeah. people do dumb stuff and then blame it on God. Yeah. It's like, you do something stupid, you're like, oh, God's punishing me. No, he's not. You're just being dumb. Like, yeah, you're facing the, the, the destruction of the world. The yourself, natural yeah. consequences of your actions. Yeah, exactly. Which God probably warned you about, but it doesn't mean he caused it. I think yeah. of it like this. Imagine like you have, you have a kid, right? And he wants to ride his bike. He goes, don't ride down the hill. And that kid decides to ride down the hill. And let's say he does it a few times. He's fine. But then let's say the fourth time he hurts himself. Yeah. That's where it says like the Holy Spirit's grieved. Because he grieved means like he's sad. Like he knows there's something better for you. It's not like he's angry or anything. But it's not like, oh, the fourth time you get hurt, like, oh, my dad caused that. Like, he really punished me. It's like, no, he just warned you and you kept doing it. And then just naturally you face the consequences of it. Yeah. And there are a lot of the, the people who say, like, God scores me are usually the people that say in order to be saved, you have to literally live like the 12 disciples. And even the 12 disciples were not worthy of, of Christ. No. I mean, Peter denied him three times. Even after Jesus died, he kept 
you know, kind of wrestling with God. He didn't want to eat the unclean food. And, well, he wrestled with the Gentile message. Yeah. The fact that he had to turn away from his. Yeah. And he didn't, I mean, he preached just in um, Israel, I believe, or just in, in yeah. Jerusalem and stuff. But it was Paul who went all, all throughout wherever. Um, but yeah, I mean, that comes to another point of mine because since we're talking about Peter denying Jesus, and he denied Jesus when um, they were accusing him of that he knew him when Jesus was going to get crucified. This is going to, I'm sounding like a heretic probably, but you know the, the, the verse where it goes, you know, if you want to be my disciple, you have to pick up your cross, deny yourself and follow. Daily, right. Right. Well, that's only in Luke, actually. Yeah, the daily. daily the the word other daily. gospels, the word daily is not there. Mm-hmm. And actually, in the, in the manuscripts of that verse, most of them don't have daily. Mm-hmm. It's a certain manuscript from the Byzantine Empire that um, theologians usually favor. So that's the only reason why daily is even there. But... I don't, I don't think Christians are called to do that, honestly. I don't even think Christians are called to be disciples, necessarily. Um, and, 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 and stick with me on this. I know it's a, oh, Christians yeah. are not a disciple, whatever. First of all, none of us are carrying a cross. Like, look what we're doing right now. We're, we're Christians, but we're, we're doing a podcast. Right. We're not, like, a cross is an execution device where you're going to be humiliate, humili- humiliated and killed in front of a bunch of people. Here we are doing a podcast. Yeah. Are we denying ourselves? No. We're doing what we want to do. Like, there's no, like, real denial here. If you want to say, like, you know, you're crucified spiritually once, okay, sure, but we're done with that. Like, it's not, it's not whatever. And then when you look at the story, Peter says, you're the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus tells them, yeah, they're going to take me. They're going to kill me. On the third day, I'm going to rise. This has to happen. Then he turns to his disciples and says, if any of you want to follow me, Deny yourself, pick up your cross, follow me. Right. He says it after he's talking about what's going to happen to him. Yeah, in context. So he very, in context, he very likely was saying, this is what's going to happen to me. If you want to be my disciple, you're going to have to follow me when it happens. That's yeah. what it sounds like to me. Yeah. And none of them follow him. He's no. the only one who picks up a cross and denies. To really deny yourself, it means like to completely give up your will. And people say, why well, deny myself by give, completely giving my will to God? First of all, how do you know your will is yeah. similar to God's? How do you know that? Yeah, Second you of all, you're not doing that. Honestly, you, you taking your, your child to the YMCA game is not you, you know. Yeah, if you miss, let's say you don't take up your cross one day or, or you do one thing that's not taking up your cross, a.k.a. sin. Right. In a lot of ways, sin, which we do daily. Right. So how can we be taking up our cross daily? Right. Like at all times if, if we're sinning and going against God on a daily right. basis. And that's that's my issue with like, the people who think that you have to be doing all these things in order to be saved, it's, um, it's like, first of all, how do you quantify it? Like, how many good things do I have to do to be saved? And second of all, that completely misses the message of the gospel, which is that you can't save yourself no matter what you do, which is why Jesus came down. If we were able to save ourselves, then we wouldn't be needing Jesus in general. The, the only issue I have with the reverse is that people think, oh, if I just have faith in Christ, I'll be saved. And then they just go on and do whatever. And you know what's interesting is, is first of all, how do Christians not see this? Like, how do Christians, like, how does, here's my problem is, is, people, like, there's that verse, right? And I ask myself, pick up your cross and, and deny yourself and, and follow him. Am I, I ask myself, am I really doing that? Like, I really use my reason, and I'm like, and this is why I think Christians have a bad rap, because they don't use their reason. They say they're getting scorched. They say they're denying themselves. They say they're picking up a cross. But if they just took a second and actually processed the words they were saying, they would realize, oh, wait, I'm just living life like a normal person, and I'm getting scorched by doing stupid things. And then a big verse that actually used to really trouble me, and now it doesn't, because I feel like I've gotten the proper interpretation of it, is faith without works is dead. Mm-hmm. What do you think of what do you think of that? People usually use that when people talk about being saved just by grace. It's impossible to really use that as a point because there's, you know, another verse that says you are saved by faith alone, not by works and own boast. So you're kind of at a standstill if you take that stance. I can just fire back with that statement. It's like, oh, well. So are they in contradiction, is, the verses? No, because I do think that faith can be proven with works. But if you have faith, that faith is real, regardless of what you do. It's just a, I think that verse is mentally pointed at people who are like, okay, I believe in Christ. Now I'm saved. I'm just going to go do whatever. Yeah. It's like, no, like, if you're going to be a follower of Christ, you should 
commit your mind to Christ. And if you commit your mind to Christ, your heart, then you will do works. That's, that's why faith without works is dead, because you don't have faith at all. If you're not at least orienting your mind and at least have the, the drive to do works, which every Christian naturally will if they have faith. So. You know how I see it? I see it as it's it's faith and works are so intertwined that you might as well be saying the same thing. Yeah. In that, like, is Jesus God? Yes. Yes. Is the Father God? Yes. Is Jesus and the Father God? Yes. Yeah. So they're they're it's they're so intertwined that you could say the same statement. Does faith save you? Yes. Does faith and works save you? Yes. Technically speaking, because if it's faith, then you're going to have works a lot. Like mm-hmm. they're so intertwined with one another that you might as well say they're they're the same yeah. thing in that sense um so i don't really but but the problem is that so many people use that to scare people you know like i i people people law observant christians torah observant christians yeah. use this a lot they're like we're still called to follow the law and then you'd say no well this is where i think they're like faith without works is dead faith without works is dead but it's like relax first of mm-hmm. all like that's why i think christianity is the most philosophically sound actually because if you use belief, like when people say, oh, well, you said be a good person to go to heaven. It's like, well, how do you define good? And by what standard are you using that? And how many good works? What if I do really good works? Like I'm donating to the children's hospital and stuff. I'm working like for the homeless shelter for 50 years. Then the last five years of my life, I decided to completely just stop doing any sort of works. Then I die. Mm-hmm. What happens there? If, am I saved or am I not saved? There's no, if someone saw me at the end, they'd probably be like, oh, you're probably not saved. Yeah, and people forget that God's chosen one other than Jesus, like God's chosen Jew, King David, committed not only adultery, but he also sent his friend on the front line to die. So if we're saying that you have to be qualified for heaven in any sort of way, then, I mean, Jesus is, or God's, you know, top chosen prophet um, completely missed the mark, too, because right. t- 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 he totally denied God in that scenario. Right. So, and I was actually, because those Bible, um, we used to do Bible studies, and a lot of times it was with people who sort of had that line of thinking. It's like, you have to do these things daily. And that would, like, make me depressed. Like, I, I felt like I had to be a slave in order to be saved. It's like, but that's not the message of the gospel. The gospel isn't a message of giving up your freedom and just completely relinquishing yourself. It's, one, a message of love that someone would come and die for you so that all your iniquities would be paid for. Um, yeah, so we were doing Bible studies with a group of people who believed in that sort of way of thinking that you had to back up your faith with works daily and that in order to be saved, you essentially had to live like the 12. And that line of thinking, like when they were trying to preach this to me, I, I was like depressed for like three days. I, I didn't even want to be a Christian. I was like, at that point, at this point, I might as well just you know, try and live my life how I want when I die, go to hell. Because I didn't think I was going to be even able to do it because I hate, like, evangelism, for example. But when I understood that the message of the gospel wasn't just a message of going out and doing doing things, it was a message of love, that you're not qualified, yet God sent essentially himself to die for us in a gruesome way so that I could be saved despite my not only just sins and like lust, but also just by failures to meet God's standard in action as well. So what do you feel about Christians having to follow the law? Oh, no. I mean, Jesus even says, I forget how that exact passage goes, but he says that he followed his father's commands perfectly. Right, right. And now he gives us a new commandment, which is to love your neighbor We'll love one another. Love one another. I love loved you. Right. Yeah. How are people? How have people miss that verse? I think it's because people generally want it to be a certain way. I mean, look I, at I, that's hard. Like, by the way, the verse, the, the complete verse, in case you guys don't know, is, is just as I have done my Father's commandments, I want you guys to do my commandments. Something along those lines. So Jesus fulfilled the Old Testament law. That's what it means. I came to fulfill yeah. the law. Not yeah, not not destroy it. not destroy it. The law is still in effect, and he fulfilled it by living it out completely. Mm-hmm. Now his commandments. He people are like, well, God's law is perfect. So what do you mean? Like, 
well, God's law can be perfect, but it can still not apply. God can choose not to apply it by a certain standard. Just because the point of the law, people assume, is for us to live by it. What if that was never the purpose? What if it's perfect, holy, and just, and that's the standard of God, yet he never wanted us to live? And he didn't. He didn't want us to eat from the, the tree yeah. of good and evil. He never wanted us to live by his law. Also, we still, like, as Christians, we try not to sin. It's not like we're completely unleashed. It's We still have, we still follow uh, principles. Right. You know, we try to live in the steps of Christ. But if you but, love one another, mm-hmm. you're not going to break the law. If you love God and right. one another, that's the whole law fulfilled. Yeah, exactly. You're not going to lust after everyone. You're not going to lie to anyone. You're not going to be slothful. If you love yourself, I think there's an essence where you have to love yourself as well. Someone you should care for who has value. So you're not going to be slothful. You're not going to be, you know, doing whatever. I, I don't see why I need to have 618 commandments telling me how to live. This doesn't seem, that's not what God intended because at the beginning of Adam and Eve with God, mm-hmm. walking with God. That's how it was intended. So we live by the Spirit, walking with God rather than looking at a, a law book. Yeah, and even more than just like that passage, Peter's also told by God to eat what was before unclean food, do not call what I've made unclean. So even just in that passage, also it completely, you know, throws away the those sorts of restrictions from the law, along with like circumcision um, from Paul. So I think those laws are not in effect at all. Yeah, and Jesus says yeah. it's not what goes into you that makes you unclean, it's what comes out. Yeah. So it's like what you say, it's not about what you're eating. Yeah. Like you guys are focusing on what you're eating so much, and you're not focusing on how you're speaking yeah, to one another. Your behavior, you know, like your spirit, what, right. What actually matters. I'm trying to think of another verse that, that, was, that was bothering me, but I can't really remember it. Um, but I do think Christians need to relax on this. I think a lot of people, and I just think they're not reasonable. Like, you can yeah. be reasonable and be a, any sort of religion. You can be reasonable. I mean, God created reason. Yeah. And I was, like, we both go on YouTube a lot. We debate a lot of people well, on a lot of social media, media platforms. I noticed, like, as from talking to Christians, it's just like politics. Like, it's people, like, kind of pick a side, and it's almost like they become... What's the word? I don't want to say like brainwashed, but they, they become so fixated on that side and their beliefs that they'll, they'll never think a certain, a different way. And I think that's kind of becoming true for Christians is we have like our, our own view interpretation of God. And that's like, we're not giving it up. Even if we read like a different line of scripture, it's just, we have, we're set on what, what we want to believe. So, right. We're putting on being right over loving one another, which right. is the main commandment. Yeah. And it, you know, and if you want to argue, I mean, just read it, see what it says. It's pretty clear there that you're not supposed to be arguing with one another, you know. But but then again, I argue with people because it's just hard not oh, to. Cause, yeah, well, we're falling. <laughs> I mean, we, yeah, totally. I mean, I think part of it's also an insecurity. Of, there's always it that, that that I always have had this, like, I could be wrong. But yeah. everything, I could be, like, I'm not dogmatic about this sort of thing. Yeah. I could be wrong. So when I see people argue a different side. I, I get insecure and I want to yeah. argue and be like, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. But I kind of just need, there's kind of like a rest God wants for everyone. Yeah. I think people just need to take up because too much struggle, too much fighting and everything. So Yeah, and that's like um, Jesus says to sort of be like a child. Right. Um, and part of that is just because you don't want to overthink it. You know, right. you just want to be sort of joyous and loving. And that's that's all it's about. It's not about keeping all these laws and doing all these things daily it's just like a child just be grateful for what you have be joyful um and that's and love one another one love one another that's like how what better ways are to worship god than to just do that so that's that's just my main issue with the tour observant christians and all that i just think they also act like they have a secret like they found like a secret scroll yeah. that only they have like that they're gonna like it's like yeah, yeah it's like a, an elitist mentality it's like we're, yeah well it's like we have the knowledge right it's like they it's sort of like like the pharisee and we talked about like, cults in our class and it's like it's it's a select group that has a select piece of knowledge used as one charismatic leader i don't know if they have one i don't think they do but they believe that they have this kind of revelation i'm, I'm sure like all religions are like this but they are especially dogmatic about it. It's very difficult to live up to. It's very difficult to understand even, um, whereas compared to like the actual gospel message. But you said something I want to I want to touch on really quick. Um, the fact that having joy in life and stuff. In the book of Ecclesiastes, 
I just read the, the, the book again, and I actually kind of understood it more as so I'm talking about it. Um, it was saying how joy is given by God, because if you don't have God, you can't take joy in anything you do. Like you're toiling for nothing. You're doing things for nothing. You're, you're having pleasure. What do you think about that? Well, I guess that kind of goes back to our question is of if our lives even have meaning then. I mean, for me, I, I would take joy as almost complete meaning of besides, I guess, God himself. Like from an emotional standpoint, I get meaning from the joys I feel. And if you can't feel joy, um, not like separate from God, then that would also answer. That would also say that I would say maybe our lives don't have meaning without God. Unless you could derive another sense of meaning. Um, although the definition of joy could be different from just bliss, which is what I think like non-believers would say experience, which is a sense of bliss and they're they're satisfied with that. But joy is probably a pure, a more pure sense of, of happiness. It's it's true happiness, true joy. So that would I think that's probably what he's referring to. It's not that there's just either happiness or no happiness. There's joy, which is the real, the true happiness. And then there's like a level of happiness that you can get without God, let's say, that's sort of subjective. But the truth, that's that comes from God. Yeah, I mean, I think everyone can experience joy. But I think, especially when I used to struggle with the idea of death, like one day I'm going to die. It's hard to even find joy in the things you're doing when you understand that yeah. truth. And it's like, let's say you have a career, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to do this career. For what, though? Just for just to sustain yourself, to have whatever little pleasure you can have. You have a family, and then you guys grow old and you die. Like, what was the meaning of all that if all of the things you work for are left to other people? All of the wisdom you you accumulated is now gone. There was no, it was like um, Solomon said, <clears throat> striving after the wind. Like, you're, you're facing an impossible sort of sort of battle, and it it's... What's interesting, though, is wisdom was one thing where it says it's more, why is it more valuable than ignorance, for example, if it's all in vanity anyway? Well, it is all in vanity, but wisdom, an ignorant person won't look at their death. An ignorant person will kind of just go through the motions and kind of just, you know, yeah, 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 won't even like, but a wise person will become more sorrowful because they understand more of reality that just how meaningless the soul yeah. is and how we're just going to die and it doesn't even matter. But when you look at your death, and you fear it, that's where I think you get into real kind of joy because there's an escape with that with God. Yeah. And like take Bill Gates. When he dies, it's all gone. Right. All of those billions of dollars, all those companies, Microsoft, all the all the stuff he's buying, it's all gone. Right. And then what's he going to be left with? He's If he's not a follower of God, he's, he would be going to hell and there's just, that's it. There's no... Right. It, just, it would all just be left to his whoever comes after him. So that's why there's so much more when you have a faith, like a hope in God, that once you die, those riches that you stored up in heaven, now that that's all yours and it's everlasting. It's, and it's true. It's the most treasure you could ever have. Right. There's a parable that he just gives. It's the farmer gets a really good crop yield this one year. It's like, oh, I'm going to upgrade my storages. Yeah. It's not like classic land. But yeah. I'm upgrade my storage <laughs> done for. But it's, let me increase my surges so I can have all of this yield tonight. We're going to drink, eat, and be merry. And God says to him, your soul is required of you tonight. Mm -hmm. You're not being merry, and you're not going to enjoy. All those crops you had are going to be eaten by moths, or they're going to be given to someone else. So all of that toil this man has done for a whole year, I suppose, because this one yield, is gone. It's yeah. completely gone to waste. And he thought, it's also a testament of don't make plans. Mm -hmm. In the letter of James talks about this too. Don't make plans for the future. You can have a plan. Like you can have a, James says, but say God willing. It's not a set plan. You have to realize that, you know, you say in the, in a year I'm going to be here, but it's completely different. I said with UCLA, like we had certain plans three years ago that were not UCLA. Like yeah. we, the fact that I even went to community college, I was going to go to like Azusa Pacific, right out of high school. My grades were okay. Or I was going to go to like a D3 NIA to play baseball. And that was the plan, like get like a small scholarship, play at some school with 2,000 people. Um, I get looked at for community college for PCC. I play baseball. I hate it. I quit. Go to a UCLA party. Now I'm at UCLA. Then you follow my footsteps to go to UCLA. Who would have thought that we'd be here? But the plans that we had were completely yeah. different. Yeah. I mean, in high school, I had like a 
barely a 2.5. You were I dumb. Think. You were I, I, was, dumb. <laughs> I was dumb bad. I was lost. And I came to PCC and I was like, initially I was like, I'm probably just going to drop out. Like, like this whole school thing probably isn't for me. I was like very, um, what's the word? Rebellious about like the whole education system. But I just like randomly decided to buckle down and, you know, I got here. And if I didn't get here, I would have never found a community. I would have never found Christ. So that could have been even God interviewed. Yeah, the fact that you buckled down. Yeah. I don't think you guys understand. This kid, <laughs> this kid got an F in like geometry. algebra, like geometry. Like, how do you get an F in high school geometry? All you have to do is like just do the homework. Bro, as soon as I started putting letters in math, it was <laughs> over for me. No, but like seriously, like, grade, was, I was done. like, and then you go to PCC, which is not easy. Like PCC was decently yeah, difficult, and you got like a four. You got better grades than I did. So the fact that you even buckled down in that manner, like, you can say that was something inside of you that was always there. But how do you say it's not God? No, he's that like, was, I'm going to get this kid to UCLA whether he likes it or not. It was the most random sense of motivation. I had the sense of motivation when I came to Christ recently too, which I'll get into. But when I was at PCC, I didn't finish like school and work because I was working at a law firm too until like 7 p.m. or 9 p.m. on Thursdays. Like I was doing work for like 10 hours when in high school I was ditching class to go to go get lucky boys and <laughs> whatnot before a baseball game. I wasn't even committed to staying the whole day at school. Um, We're yeah, looking back on it, seven hours a day was kind of ridiculous. It was right? ridiculous. That's Especially a lot of time waking up that early. It was... Oh, that was, that, that honestly, that might even been why I did so bad. It was just high school was not not the right setting. But even in community college, the fact that I found the motivation combined with working a job that was not fun to work. It was just now looking back, it might have been that sort of thing. And when I first met that community, um, I had a friend text me, who and she told me, "Hey, come to this fall retreat tomorrow." in this place like six hours away. She texted me this at like 6 p.m. the night before, the day before, and like, if you know me, I don't do things that are outside of my comfort zone at all. I, I'm a hermit, I stay at home, I'm playing video games. And the fact that she asked you the night before, <laughs> she probably was not, no offense, she probably was not yeah, planning on exactly. even inviting you, but then just something within her was like, you know, I should invite him. To yeah, this. I probably wasn't on the forefront of her mind, right. which is fair because I only went to like one church service and I didn't follow up at all afterwards. In fact, I was like, after church service, I was kind of like not into it. I was still like, I, did, I was like, I, didn't, I don't really like those this whole Christian thing still. And I just completely dropped it, even... Like reading the Bible, I, I had completely stopped. I was sort of in that sort of depression phase that we were talking about. And then she texted me that day, and just for some reason, I was just like, sure, we'll go. It sounds fun. And I just randomly decided to go, and it was life-changing. It was at that trip that I really both understood the gospel and, like, truly put my faith in it and, like, committed myself to it. So that was, like, a, a trippy experience where I think, like, God had plans for me that I didn't have plans for myself right. at all. So and you only realize that when you look back. And exactly. you can't, like, when, you, when you're in it, you're like, kind of just whatever. But as I look back as to how we even got here with a camera in front of us, yeah. doing a podcast, like, who would have thought that we would have been in this kind of, like, sure, we're not like maybe big or anything. But, <laughs> but the fact that we're even in this kind of position where I thought I was going to be playing baseball, probably would have wanted to jump off a cliff because I hated baseball. So but I, didn't, wouldn't, I wouldn't tell anyone that I hated yeah. baseball. I would just do what I'm told. Um, I didn't want to make anyone upset. So I'm like, I'm still playing baseball. I'm just not even telling anyone. You are flunking out of geometry. And here we are just kind of like at UCLA doing a podcast. Like, you know what the, the funniest part about me failing my class was? You could retake tests as many times <laughs> as you wanted. You could turn in homework assignments whenever you wanted. Yeah, I still yeah, failed still the class. Because I didn't even want to go in to sign up for a retest because I would I would have had to do it at lunch. And I didn't want to, like, use my free time to take a test. So I I wasn't, like, expecting it. I thought I was going to get, like, a C-. minus, But and then the F came, like, oh, shoot. That was just, yeah, that was bad. I think high school is so stupid. Yeah, they need to, I think they really need to change the way they I don't see it. why we don't just complete, but they don't want to. The government doesn't want to. We'll get into that. We're not going to get into that. But just to us to revamp it to where kids just aren't, like, just basically, they're basically just, it's just a way of having kids in an environment where they're not out on the streets doing some crazy stuff. Yeah. And let's just teach them what we want to teach them. 
instead of like let's actually let them like critically think about certain like if they would just let me read books that would have been a way better education i've learned more reading just online than i have in high school i would just do my homework before class mm -hmm. and then just turn it in half-assed and i didn't learn anything from yeah. it like it's just from reading books i really feel like i developed as a person not from high school and pretty much everything I learned, I mean, take this from a, a really bad student. I didn't learn anything from high school. Everything I learned was from outside experiences. And like now I want to go to law school. I want to be a lawyer. And even now I haven't been given a lick of law. <laughs> like They don't let, there's no law major. I have to major there's in history. There's pre-law. No, well, I am pre-law. I already am pre-law. I Wait. still do history, though. What do you mean you're pre-law? Yeah, I'm pre-law. So pre-law isn't a major. It's sort of, it's something you declare, but it's separate from your major. So I'm a pre-law history major. You declare to be a pre-law. Yeah. Or I, are you just saying you're pre-law? No, I, you declared. They, when do you they, declare they, that? They sent me, like, an email. And I, I missed, like, I missed that. Stuff. So either way, as, as pre-law, you don't do much law at all unless you decide to go out of your way to go into like clubs or something you hear that i'm really confused uh, i'm becoming a history teacher then because i didn't declare for pre -law. no you don't have to do it dude i haven't done anything with it it's just i just said okay and declaration yeah it was actually during my orientation because i told him i want to go to law school yeah but like people like logan paul and people who are like influencers or twitch streamers like that that's probably fun but like the work that I was, that I'm probably going to be doing, um, is probably not going to be fun. But it's some law is something I'm good at. It's something I'm, it, it pays well. I'm good at it. So I'm, and it's also flexible. A law degree, you can do a lot of things. So that, that's sort of my plan. And it kind of goes back to like, is there meaning in life without God? But then once you really believe, it was interesting because Jordan Peterson, for example, doesn't say. It's like, what right do I have to say I believe in God? Because if you, if you, de you declaring that doesn't mean anything. So I, a lot of people say they believe in God, but if you truly believe in God, you're going to have like a kind of transformation. Change and that. and I think I somewhat have had, not addressed, because there's always some sort of doubt, right? If we absolutely, like if Jesus, like the Apostle Paul, for example, had Jesus go right in front of him, right? then the man just goes through hell his yeah. whole life, but he's just, because he knows, he knows for an absolute fact that Jesus is the Messiah that they were waiting for, and God is real and all this stuff. So he's going to de dedicate his whole life to it. Obviously, none of us have that kind of faith. But I do have belief and faith in this. I see. I think we can see that with, you know, people are, especially younger people, are living lives without meaning, and they're trying to search for it other places than Christianity, because Christianity has a bad rap. And that's kind of, I'm not saying I want to be like a Christian influencer or anything, but I want to present Christianity in such a way, that's why like I really believe in this, and I really think this is important, because I want to present Christianity in a sound, philosophical way that's practical for life, that isn't what has been taught already by all these old people who, you know, for example, I was talking about this, um, you know, a lot of sexual sins is a huge thing that older pastors especially talk about, yeah. like, how, you know, sexual sin's the worst and all that stuff. And like, okay, yeah, it's a sin and stuff, but like, this is coming from a 60-year-old guy who probably, a bottle of Viagra won't get him, you know, whatever. <laughs> like, like, you're kind of talking like 20-year-old testosterone-ridden dudes yeah. for the most part. It's like, you know, pipe down a little bit about, it. but that's not the point of any of the sins, any sins that are being right. struggled with. That's not the point of the, the point is it's like a transformative way of life where you can actually find meaning and joy in life because you believe in something transcendent and objectively real because we have historical evidence of someone who lived and that's just not i mean you, you'd be surprised by the kind of questions people ask but be like you seriously don't know the answer to that and not in like a in a looking down on the kind of way it's like no one has taught you this yeah no you have but but also people have assumptions about christianity that they shouldn't for example like oh well, the old testament supports slavery it's like if you just take a google search yeah. and figure out the context of what's being said it's not slavery like we think of it. Yeah, most it's people, completely different. Yeah, most people don't actually read through it. It's, there's a lot of people, like I see on TikTok, they'll point out that Leviticus right. um, passage and it say it supports a certain thing. But um, I was doing discipleship because I'm being discipled right now. And yesterday I was like, I'm struggling not seeing people who are like opposed from us, like let's say non-believers. Right, I heard you say Yeah, 
specifically people were like not necessarily persecuting us but they're sort of against us i was like i'm having trouble not seeing them as the enemy when the enemy is really something much greater and the devil and he told me you know when you when you have a sort of mindset remember the church is to blame too for a lot of a lot of people not believing a lot of people opposing us like the catholic church does not have a good history so when when he told me that i was like oh it sort of is our fault that you know things are like this and even now there's still people who like witch hunt people for certain things so yeah i think it's partly our fault i think now it's our responsibility to fix yeah but i also think just some people just like there, right. there, there are people who try to say abortion is not a sin by using a certain story in the Bible where it has nothing to do with the book. Yeah, it was, yeah, I think it was, I don't remember the passage. I, I it's a story of a woman who they're trying to see of adultery and she eats, she drinks this sort of like thing that the priest makes. Yeah. And if she did commit adultery, her womb would shrivel up. Yeah. But it tells nothing. First of all, one of the passages that talks about, um, one of them says miscarry. That's one translation out of 50. Yeah. The, the others go, it will, your womb will show, basically you won't have kids. Yeah. There's no abortion taking place. And anyway, what does it matter if God did an abortion, let's yeah. say? It's, it's his, his authority. he's not killing anyone. Mm -hmm. He's just transferring them. We're not, we don't get to decide who lives and who dies. He does. That's why it's against the law yeah. for us to kill people. Because we don't get to decide who, who we want to kill. Right, God as the creator can take what he wants. Right. But we as his creations who are sharing this world we can't do the things that god does that's why when people say why does god commit sin it's it, you can't equate what we do to what god does. i've well, never heard but, anyone say that no when this. when god wipes out sodom it's like oh. why does god kill people like why did he sin it's like they try to say it that's like contradictory it's like well god does if sin. you kill someone in self-defense is that a sin well, you know, God had reason to... No, there's, to there's certain out. instances where killing someone is not a sin and it's justified. Yeah. I'm doing a video on this, so I'm just going to mention it briefly here. I really do think that people, like, if people really thought outside of the... I think a lot of people who are agnostic or atheists don't really think about it. Like, they seriously just don't, like, just take a second and just... They kind of just assume a lot of, like, why we're here. They assume we're here to live our lives, get married, have children, get a lot of money, get some things, and then die. But why do you assume something like that? Like, imagine, imagine if we're on, everyone is here for the glory of God that we're supposed to walk with Him. That is the only purpose why we're here, nothing else. I, I gave this example, I'll give this, if people are even watching this for, I'm going to give this example in the video I make. Um, it's like a manager calling five people up. Well, imagine the five people are everyone on the planet and the manager's God. Hey, I've given you guys a manual. Um, I want you guys to come play basketball for me. Anything that you guys need to know is in that manual. And be ready because the enemy knows how to play basketball. Mm -hmm. Like, they're really good. So, okay, we're like, whatever. So, we get there, and then the basketball starts, and the manager's on the sidelines. The basketball comes, and we just start kicking it to each other like we're playing soccer. We are so unaware of what game we're playing. Yeah. And let's add another thing to that. Imagine if the, on the court, that says an asphalt court, has a soccer field painted on it. And that's why we think we're playing soccer. It's like yeah, the allegory of the cave. The seed, yeah. It's like the people in the cave are seeing the, the things on the wall, the light, seeing, thinking that's reality. And someone's like, no, 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 the light's up there. You guys are in a cave. Like, no, 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 this is reality right yeah. here. That's where I feel like it's happening. People are just assuming reality is a certain way. Whereas you guys can be kicking a basketball right now yeah. just around to each other. That's because you guys think meaning's going to be found from possessions or even, even, even things that seem like justified like getting a family or being kind to people that's not the why do you assume that that's the meaning i don't like that could be the completely wrong game yeah people have no idea i think about the spiritual battles going on and there there are probably a lot of people who are just ignorant to it but there could be a lot of people who have had like rough life experiences maybe they didn't have a complete family maybe they had abusive family members and you know it's just they've sort of been lost and some of them won't find their way back, and we pray that those people do find their way back. But more than ignorance, although that's also a factor. I'm more talking about complacency. Yeah, like people, people are just assuming just, things, yeah. but they really just took a second to think. Because I don't think you need to be some intellectual genius to think, mm -hmm. what am I doing here? Like, what am I actually, what is the purpose? Like, even if you said you believe we're in a matrix, like, I'll take your word for that one, because honestly, we could be. Like, we wouldn't even know it. We have, like, the, but for people to think that all of this, all of matter, 
just came into existence and now we're just all here doing what we're doing and we're just here by accident. I mean, I think the Matrix is more likely than that, to be honest. Yeah, and actually Frank Turk says something like that. You need more faith to be an atheist right, than right. to be a Christian. Because, I mean, just looking at both the way the universe was made and morals and all those things, it's so, you can't, a lot of people think that science will figure it out eventually. Right. Like, oh, we'll see what quantum um, Physics process happens, yeah. Yeah, happen in order for the universe to exist, but I it just, it's not physically feasible. That still doesn't answer, yeah. yeah. It, even if it's plausible, right? by our human way of reasoning, it's not, it's not the probable thing. Like, we still don't even know how to regrow human hair. Yeah. Like, for bald dudes. Like, and we think we're going to figure out how we all got here. You know, I was talking to a guy who said, maybe there's an alternate dimension that created this one. I'm like, okay. Who like, created the alternate dimension? Well, for that, and, one, you need a lot of faith to, to put to put into something right. that has no evidence. And also, you're essentially describing God. The right. second dimension is heaven. I didn't even think of that, to be honest. <laughs> the second dimension is God in heaven, who right. created our universe. Right. I didn't even think of that. So, that's funny. I, honestly, unfortunately, at the time, I didn't think of that. I, <laughs> I hate when that happens. Hey, yeah. when someone says something, and just think like a few hours later, I'm like, why did I did say that? Did you realize that? after, it's like, oh, he totally described heaven. I would have heaven. so cool if I gave that response. <laughs> It's, it's like a, such a gotcha moment, but yeah. but it's like why do they, why are they so like, to think that another dimension created the whole universe? I mean, why not just believe in God at because that point? I suppose maybe they don't, people they don't, don't want they, God. Exactly, right? that's where I'm getting at. It's kind of like okay, so our camera's about to die. Unfortunately, this is a good conversation, good for the first podcast. Yeah. There's gonna be some audio issues, there's gonna be some visual issues, but I'm gonna try to edit out as much as I can. Uh, if you guys are this far. Thank you for watching. I'm going to cut this video up and put snippets of it in other videos. And I think I might put this on Spotify or something and uh, so you can just listen to the audio. Even though if there's audio issues, I can already tell. Uh, but as we keep doing these podcasts, they'll get more, you know, refined. And we'll figure out new ways to do it that is more pleasing to you guys as the viewers. So thank you guys for coming. We appreciate it. Yeah. We yeah. appreciate you guys for sticking by as we still sort of. As you're learn bumbling around. Yeah, still learn stuff. this process, but yeah, we really appreciate it. Yep, we'll see you guys next time. <sighs> Why are you you are... so nervous? Because <laughs> you're making me nervous. It's okay, when we're famous, we'll have like a blooper section. Yeah, we'll just throw this in there. I'm chilling. <laughs> <laughs> Please. Speak it. Look at me, bro. I'm trying to keep it straight. I'm trying to keep it frank. That's what I'm saying. Like, we're already <laughs> looking at each other and start laughing. We could just upload this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, stop! What do we do during the thing as we're talking? I think once we break the ice, it should be fine. Okay. Yeah. You cannot take 30 minutes to start. Uh, fuck, doing a podcast is hard, bro. <laughs> Say, my name is Age. Hi. Okay, they know who I am. Like, I, right. I, I don't know why I can't do this. I've done a ton of introductions. Or say, hey different. guys, welcome. Oh, okay. well, that's kind of weird because you have a YouTube channel. Alone. Yeah, I'm YouTube by myself, but I'm just.